Now, of course, I haven't got far enough, but I think it's reasonably difficult to catch me out in terms of a very crass distinction. And probably the crassest gap between what I believe and what I'm doing is with this today. And that's largely because I don't think people are yet ready to listen unless you do put them on a pedestal. People need the authority, and I try to break it, but if you don't play it at all, they get terribly, terribly upset. So I have to come in in that way and then try and say, look, it's a lousy way to try to operate. Where I get clobbered is when I try to relate to the industrial era. Do reasonably well at home and in my own office because I can plan my own lifestyle. I find it incredibly difficult. All right, let's see, one final one. Here we go. What place would religion... No, we've dealt with that to some extent. You've been at this for a number of years. Where do you see the bottlenecks and how can we get the media involved? Good place to stop. Well, the bottlenecks to start with are all of us. Pogo is perfectly right. We have met the enemy and them is us. It's the key set of bottlenecks. But I think you can go a little bit further. The bottleneck we have are people who deal with symbols and not with reality. People who look at unemployment rates, gross national product. Oh, the whole shooting match of theory and data that prevent us from seeing people as real. And the problem is that nearly everybody who communicates politicians, media, academia, bureaucracy. The only people who have real access to the communication channels of this culture see the world in symbol terms, in data terms, in theory terms. Those of us who care about people have no channels. Go into a bookstore and you think about the people who right in this area. They're buried under sociology or economics or political science. Why don't we go into every bookstore in town and ask them politely to create a new world bookshelf or some other jargon so we can put this stuff together? Why don't we begin to work with papers and magazines and the media and say, how do you get this sort of stuff across? Because it is not news. I talk to UP, I talk to the American Society of Newspaper Editors, and they say to me, Bob, at the end of the lecture, a lot of them, that was fascinating, really groovy stuff. I see them a couple of months later and I say, I read your paper and I read your paper after I made my speech and you didn't have anything about it in there. Well, why did it happen? And they said to me, oh, but it wasn't news. And the best ones of them smile rather wryly at me as they make that statement because they're the people who run that newspaper. The news is a way of selling papers and keeping people watching television. Therefore, every event must be the biggest event since the beginning of time, because otherwise, why will they turn on tomorrow? There's no place for trends, no place for development of humanity. It's not news. And the argument that you must only report things that are news because the things that aren't news are not important seems to me to be absolutely destructive of everything that we believe in because what people hear about is the way they believe the world works. Why are we so pessimistic? Because the only thing that is reported on in this culture is all of the things we should justifiably be pessimistic about. And when we do report on things that we shouldn't, they sort of get buried on page 77 under the League of Women Voters held an interesting meeting at which 50 people were present. So I think what we begin to do is we find out how to communicate and be concerned at the human level. And I come back again, and this is where we start this afternoon. How do we create connections? And how do we create new dreams of what we want 
and I believe it's a bicentennial issue, America's third century to be. And I'm going to come in with some very clear-cut, pragmatic possibilities. And I hope over lunch that you will think about the following question. Am I willing, if I become convinced that the sort of things that Bob Theobald puts forward are feasible, and that's something you have a right to judge, am I willing to put some of my life over the next year or two years into changing the society or not? Because what we usually do is everybody has a groovy time and everybody says, hey, that was great. And everybody goes away and says, yes, of course we're going to put time into this. And then the days go by and they find out, oh, but we've got so many things we have to do. And it drops. I'd much rather we come out of this afternoon with 10 or 15 or 20 people who mean it than with 50 people who say, yes, it sounds groovy and who drop out. The dynamics are so much better if we start from the people who are going to stick. I'm going to ask one other thing. I hope that we're going to come out with some pragmatic answers. They're going to involve, if all goes well, the Twin Cities and the state. So if you know some people who ought to be here, go and use the telephone. It exists for that purpose, to communicate with people. And get them here and give them, give them an opportunity to be involved and to put their input into what they want to see happen. Because there is a chance that we will build something significant in this city, in these cities, in this state. And it starts from the beginning, because it's rather surprising how much of what one talks about at the beginning tends to end up as what you do. So I hope some of you will come back this afternoon. Of course, you all remember we said that there would be no applause, right? Thank you. Dr. Anderson, Dr. Newman, and uh, I hesitate to say my friends. I'm sure some of you in the audience may or may not be my friends by the, the end of this impassioned diatribe. <laughs> However, I, I, was, I was struck uh, by one uh, comment made in the, in, in the introduction uh, that I uh, represent the uh, uh, essentially a paradigm of the uh, of the fact that um, it's possible to uh, uh, to be both a woman and a scientist and a wife and a mother and a gourmet cook make your own drapery all things not only to all men but to all children and all women well it sounds kind of easy when you, when you, uh, when you hear it rattled off uh, that way. I suppose it is possible. All you have to do is to be strong as a horse, work 26 hours a day, have a husband who is rather unique as husbands go and uh, who is prepared to let you be an outstanding scientist, a gourmet cook, make the drapery, wait on them hand and foot. <laughs> Not many husbands are prepared to do that. They don't want you to be a scientist. <laughs> All I can tell you is, as, as, as my 60th birthday stares me in the face, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm very tired. Uh, it's been a tough, tough situation all the way along. Fortunately, I come from hardy peasant stock on my mother's side. <laughs> and I was, able, I was able to swallow whole the entire mythology, which was to say that, that as a woman, I was just damned lucky to be allowed to use my brain that the good Lord had given me. I felt very lucky each time I was allowed 
to take a man's job. You see, it's written in tablets of stone <laughs> that the jobs that pay anything and have any social status require testicles. No applicant with ovaries need apply. Now, to those of you who at 10 o'clock in the morning are not quite prepared for endocrinology, I can only tell you that having spent my life, my adult life as an endocrinologist, this sort of thing comes naturally to me at any time of the day. I must say, though, that my husband finds it very hard to take, particularly when in conversation I use the term castration. He is unaware of the fact, apparently, that castration refers to the removal of the gonads of both males and females. It is not a male-oriented term, but the castration of females in intellectual terms, just extrapolating the word, has been occurring for a long time, except women don't think of it that way, nor do men. And very frankly, I never thought of it that way either until relatively recently. As I said, I was very glad to be able to do all these things that were uh, rather unusual for my generation. Although I was born just as women were making the final push to get the vote. And in the, in, in the early 20s, when I was growing up as a child, and getting all the social input, the overflow from the suffragist movement permeated to a very large degree some of the thinking in education. There was a kind of euphoria amongst certain women that at last women had achieved their goals. They had gotten the vote. It was a long, heartbreaking, bloody struggle. And finally, women had achieved the goal. Now, there are several things interesting about the suffragist movement that have implications for what's going on right now. To begin with, the obvious problem was that the only way women could get the vote was to convince men that this was in not only the interest of women, but also in the interests of men, because it was men that had to vote them the right to vote. Women could not, in the course of a, uh, any amount of rioting or burning down of cities, could not have gotten the vote unless the entire government had been overturned. Within the constitutional framework, men had to vote women the right to vote. It therefore became necessary to convince men that we were in this together. And in fact, many men became the strongest fighters for women's suffrage. They sacrificed career and personal success to fight alongside women for suffrage. But I'd like to point out to you that the impetus for the movement had to come from within the women. There had to be a cadre of women in this country who felt deeply, profoundly, that any human being in a democracy denied the right to vote was in fact not a participant in that society. And many men became convinced of this, and not only because of the women, but because they felt that no society in which they wanted to live could exclude more than 50% of the population from citizenship, from full citizenship. And so together, men and women got women the vote. And there was a great sense of achievement because, you know, most of the women in this country, till the very last, kept saying, I don't want the vote. Now, to those youngsters in the room, this may sound very strange. Imagine a woman saying, don't allow me to be a full-fledged person. 
don't allow me to be a citizen. Please don't allow me to vote. And yet that happens to have been the case. It was women who spat at the suffragists and called them the 19th century equivalent of kooks. It was women who said loud and righteously, I like being a woman. I don't need the filth of doing what men do. I don't want to go out into the marketplace and vote. That's nasty male stuff. Now notice what these women were saying. They were putting down men. At the same time, they seemed to be overtly glorifying them. They were saying, let men do all those dirty things out there running the world. I'm pure. I'm sensitive. I will stay within the confines of my clean home. Let men do all of that. I'm too delicate in spirit and soul. Now, unfortunately, I came on the scene far too late to be able to use four-letter words with ease. If I could, I would tell you what I think of that kind of formulation of society. But you can use your own four-letter words. But the fact of the matter is, this was an, another example in the numberless examples of human beings destroying themselves like the lemmings rushing into the sea, laughing and singing all the way, like the blacks in the South, of course, in slavery. You might ask psychologically, why did women do that to themselves? Well, that's just one of many problems you have to ask about human behavior. Why did James Forrestal, a rich, successful member of a president's cabinet, World War II, why did he kill himself? He had everything. Why do young men and young women from suburban, affluent homes who have been given everything, why do they become heroin addicts? These are very profound questions, and I'm not here to answer them for you, even if I have the answer. The fact of the matter is we need not be surprised that women did that to themselves, because men do equally self-destructive things to themselves. Nevertheless, men helped women get the vote, and they got the vote. And what a victory for America. Women got the vote, and what did they do? They changed the social order. They went out, and the first time they voted, they voted for Warren Harding. <laughs> of whom his father once said, thank God that Warren wasn't born a girl. He would have been pregnant all the time. He could never say no. <laughs> we might say that about several fellows in Washington at the present time. Frankly, though, I think that pregnancy is less of a danger to society. <laughs> However, we had a chance to redeem ourselves after we learned what society was really like. We were just sharpening our wits with that first election. But women are sensitive to social problems, and so the next time they had a chance to vote, they redeemed themselves. They voted for Calvin Coolidge. Now, Calvin Coolidge, when he got out of the White House, he wrote a book. We had a great economist here last night, Mr. Galbraith. And Mr. Galbraith, I'm sure, uh, is very fond of this book. Because the first sentence of the book says, in the United States, when men are out of work, there is unemployment. <laughs> what economic insight. As my mother used to say, God rest her soul, it takes a man. <laughs> now, women have been going ahead in this fashion ever since then. 
Then they elected Herbert Hoover, and they got two chickens in every pot for about 15 minutes. Then they even lost the pot. And so on and so on and so on. All you can say about that is that women don't seem to be very different from men in terms of their natural proclivities when it comes to politics. How about anything else that they do? Well, we really don't know. Because what has happened is that we have done a very curious thing in this country. Nobody's ever tried the experiment before. First of all, as Mr. Galbraith pointed out, uh, economics determine not only the shape of, of cities, they, term, they determine the shape of human behavior. When families had very little money, particularly in this country, where we have a great deal of mobility socially, it was very clear that one way to move the family ahead was to educate your son. Because everyone recognized that even if you didn't have money, if you had a trained brain, you had an opportunity to get ahead. That was the, the great innovation of the United States, where your bloodlines could be quite plebeian, but if you had the skill, this society would buy it, and you could move ahead. And so the education of one's son became a matter of great significance to a family. Now, as we got a little richer, we began to buy more things, and as we got richer still, we began to buy education for our daughters. Why not? Why not indeed? But nobody knew why they were educating their daughters, and they still don't know. It's very simple about educating one son. I've just described why. His entire life will revolve about what he does with his training, one way or the other. Even if he uses his bachelor's degree in water skiing to get his foot on the first step of the academic ladder because they don't hire anyone at IBM as a junior executive without a BA. That's very clear, and it makes that degree worth supporting. If you stop a man on the street and ask him, who are you? He will usually, and this has been done, he will usually respond in the following way, unless he turns around and runs. Uh, he will say, I am John Reynolds. I am a lawyer. He will very infrequently, unless you elicit the information from him, tell you anything about his wife, his children. If you ask him, who are you? He tells you what he is in his own self-image. And what he is is a lawyer, a doctor, a carpenter, a businessman, a college president, that's what he is. Stop a woman on the street. Ask her, who are you? Most of the time, she will not even say, I am Alice Reynolds. She will say, I am Mrs. John Reynolds. My husband is, or I have two children. She tells you what she sees herself as, and she's quite right. But what comes out of this is no indication, essentially, of Alice Reynolds. Now, you've heard all of this before. Ad nauseum. Does it have any meaning at all? Yes, it does. Because, as Mr. Galbraith pointed out last night, there is a progression in the development of cities. There is also a progression in the development of human beings. Our genes haven't changed. Our hormones haven't changed. What has changed is our perception of ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the world. And that's what education does for you. 
When Copernicus pointed out that the earth went around the sun, the ripples from that are still affecting our behavior. That was an intellectual perception. Now, women have a perception of themselves which was, for many centuries, very useful for the society. Number one, nobody lived very long. At the turn of the century, the life expectancy was about 48 or 49. Now, for women, it's 78, going up higher all the time. For men, around 70, something of that sort. They are a very fragile sex, and we haven't taken as good care of them as we women should have. They need to be sheltered and cherished and protected. Just move over, boys. Let us help you on the way to the bank and to the top position. You've got a heart and blood vessels that need protecting. You've got the wrong hormones for good blood vessels. Estrogen, that's what blood vessels like. But I'm not denigrating testosterone, great hormone, no home should be without it. <laughs> but in terms of survival, you pay a price for it. Now, it was very useful and people didn't live very long. Women were pregnant all the time and dying in childbirth in large numbers. If you read the history of this country, the revolutionary period, with the exceptions, of some extraordinary women who somehow survived, like Abigail Adams. Other women had one child after another. Jefferson's wife lived 10 years, had seven deliveries, and died at the end of that 10-year period of the accretion of the damages done in each pregnancy. And they knew that each pregnancy would kill her just a bit more. There was nothing could be done about it. There were no birth control techniques except abstinence, which except for a few remarkable people whom we elevate to sainthood has not been a very useful technique. <laughs> and you know what they've traditionally done with saints? They've burnt them. <laughs> so that women were in no position being pregnant all the time, and many of them ailing a good bit of the time, and having to care for large families, and having truly to weave the cloth, not because they're bored and they want something to do, but because their families needed the cloth they were weaving, and baking the bread, not because every woman in the suburb now seems to me to be starting to bake her own bread, but because there was no bakery. These were vital things that women had to do. They did them, and they died. And they served out their purposes in survival for the community. Now, as far as education was concerned, we have always given a little more education to upper-class women, because it has always been regarded as a frill that makes them more saleable more attractive. An upper-class man wants a woman who at least knows how to use the right fork, who is able to converse in a reasonably grammatical manner with another distinguished man, and as a piece of property, it's always nice to have a wife whom you're prepared to take out in public. Now, the Muslims made a much wiser solution. They figured that's a hell of a lot of trouble to go to, just to take women out in public and have them behave reasonably well. There's a much easier way. Just don't take them out in public. Put them in harem. And that works very nicely. Then you don't have to educate them. Just keep them fed and watered. And that's precisely what's going on in many parts of the world still. And women serve their function. Now you might ask, well, why do women put up with it? Well, I was in Pakistan not too long ago, 
And the wife of one of the uh, officials, we were there, I was there because of my husband as a guest of the government, and so we were getting the, uh, uh, the more uh, distinguished person tour. And uh, uh, one of the wives of one of the men was assigned to me. She had very recently removed her face veil. She had been liberated. And when I talked to her, she had been curiously uh, educated in English uh, because her husband had, in the course of his uh, career, uh, been a, uh, an ambassador to England, and she had to deal with the English servants. So she had learned English. And I talked to her, and you know, she argued very strenuously with me that actually it was much better for a woman not to have much freedom because she was completely protected and that women needed that kind of protection, she resented having taken off her veil because she felt this exposed her to potential dangers and she would have preferred to have remained in Purda. Now, doesn't that sound strange that someone would deliberately want to incarcerate themselves? Not at all. The programming that goes into women and that goes into men can do anything to the human brain. It's not strange at all. She was uncomfortable in the real world. And women still are uncomfortable very often in this country, in the real world. Perhaps not quite as uncomfortable as that woman. Now, in that Muslim mosque that I visited, there was an ancient inscription that I had translated for me, with some embarrassment, actually, and it said, No dogs, women, or other unclean animals may enter here. Now, if you bring up any human being to think of themselves as an unclean animal, they will behave in a certain kind of way. Not very surprising. Now, we've come a long way from that, haven't we? Virginia Slim is making a fortune. You've come a long way, baby. Not very long, baby. Not very long. Because what we're seeing with women is a curious kind of schizophrenia, which is destroying men as well as women and the children of men and women. We have taken women now because we could afford to educate them in good schools like Augsburg College with the best intentions in the world. And you know about the road to hell and how it's paid? And we have educated them, but for what? What are they going to do with that education? We spend $15 billion a year to educate women in college, just in college, every year in this rich country. What for? A woman with a college diploma working full-time in 1973 had an average earning comparable to a man with an eighth-grade diploma. Now, the reasons for that, if you'll stop to think for a moment, is the service jobs that men take, the plumbers, the electricians, the carpenters, the truck drivers, those jobs do not require higher education, but they're very well paid. What are the appropriate jobs for a woman, whether or not she has a college degree? doesn't really matter. A school teacher. It's a nice job in an elementary school. All you have to deal with is little children. And somehow that's appropriate. Most women MDs in the past in this country have become pediatricians. You know, nurturing and, and so on. Now, I can't imagine a worse job than being a pediatrician. Maybe I'm just not a normal woman. But it seems to me that dealing with healthy children is a pain. But dealing with sick children is a real pain. 
but they could get residencies in pediatrics. Not the good residencies, not the top residencies. Chiefs of pediatrics suddenly become the nurturers, male. Now in school teaching, there was a time in this country when elementary school teaching was so underpaid, and to be a principal of an elementary school is also to be underpaid, that most of the principals as well as the teachers in elementary school were women, because that's the job description for an appropriate job for women. Low pay, low status. That's appropriate. And anyone would want a daughter to take such a job. As soon as teaching began to be better paid and more attention was paid, the thing began to shift. Now, almost 90% of all elementary school principals are men. But that's not a unique phenomenon. When Vassar took in its first four men, the class elected one of them class president. <laughs> that shows you what women think about themselves. Take the man. Now, another appropriate job for a woman is a librarian. There's something nice about a librarian. It's a safe job. What kind of a man reads books? It's almost like entering a nunnery. Of course you'd want your daughter to take such a job. How about the heads of the great library? All the librarians I've ever met are women, with one exception, the chiefs of libraries. But it goes even beyond that. At the National Institutes of Health, where I've lectured from time to time, where I have many friends, there are um, jobs, they call them GS ratings, government service ratings. And down at the bottom of the list, are GS ratings one and two, that sort of thing. And at the top, GS 16 or 17, then the, the super grade. Now, if you look at the curve of jobs at the NIH, you find that between GS 1 and GS 9, you have most of the people employed by the federal government, by far, about 70%. And they are mainly women. And then something happens at GS9. It's a watershed. From GS9 to GS18, mostly men. Because the women are largely at the very bottom. They're the deaners. They are the dishwashers in the laboratories, the pipette washers. They're the uh, the housekeepers. Curiously, women have the genes for washing floors. But when there's a superintendent of washing floor job open, guess what happens? That gene is found on the Y chromosome. They're all men. On the other hand, you take the cadre of MDs at the NIH, and this is simply an example. It's a model system. There are many MDs at the NIH who are women. Not a single one, however, is the head of a division. There are 100 top decision-making jobs in the health establishment of the United States at the National Institutes of Health. 99 of them were held by men and one was held by a woman. Now, if you had to make a guess, what part of the health service decision-making job do you think might conceivably be held by a woman? The nursing division. Well, then they moved the division of nursing out of the NIH. Now, 100% of the decision-making jobs are held by men. Now, you have to ask the question, why? Well, I'm not entirely certain why. Uh, the, the relationships between men and women are so complex and have always been that they are the very foundation of uh, whole areas of health care, psychiatry and psychology. It's not a simple business, 
Not at all. It's far more complex than the black-white problem. Far more. Within the black community, the relationships between men and women are extraordinarily difficult. Now, the relationships between men and women cross all kinds of boundaries. I have talked to many women in this country, middle-aged women, young women, old women, and in the middle-aged category, I am impressed by several things. First of all, it is simply outrageous to tell a middle-aged woman who has done a superb job of the task that she was assigned, has been a wonderful mother, a wonderful homemaker. She has held together a family structure while the father of the family was busy doing what he felt he had to do, kill himself. To tell that woman, well, you poor slob, you shouldn't have been doing that. You should have been out there in the great world making decisions. You shouldn't have done that. You've wasted your life. That's nonsense. She hasn't wasted her life any more than her husband has wasted his life piling up money and having no contact with his children and missing out on the great joys of being able to love because we tend to program our men not to be able to feel. It becomes a matter of great strength to be the kind of man who is willing to walk over his own grandmother. That's a man. That's a horror. That's a Nixon politician at the moment. They're no different from other politicians. Just a little more so, that's all. Is that happiness? Well, the Greeks defined happiness as the use of all of one's powers to achieve excellence. Not many of us in this society achieve happiness in those terms, but these women have, in a sense, performed their jobs even better than the men of the society. After all, it's true that we have voted for the same mediocrities that men have voted for. Nevertheless, those men that we elected had in their hands the decision-making. Not a single woman in this country can be said to have participated at the highest levels of decision-making ever in this country, ever. We've had one senator who was a woman, and she inherited the job when her husband died. We've had a handful of women in the Congress playing a very small, insignificant role. Never a woman on the Supreme Court. What kind of an input have women made into decision-making? At least women can say to themselves, if I have no other distinction, at least I wasn't involved at the top decision-making in Watergate. It's a negative virtue, which is to say that if they had been involved, they probably would have done some of the same things. I'm not making a case for the fact that women are angels. They're not. They're just human beings. And when, when Freud cried out in anguish, great father Freud, who understood everything so well, couldn't understand women. It was as if he was dealing with talking horses. Had no idea what motivated them. They were these strange little creatures, rounder, smaller, smelled a little better, but they were not homo sapiens, the thinking ones. And he said, dear God, what does a woman want? What does she want? Any woman in this auditorium could tell him. Everything. That's what she wants. Just what a man wants. He wants everything that life has to offer. You may not get it. But if you're an adult human with a soul, what you want is what life can give to a human being. You want to love and be loved. You want to lead and be led. You want to protect and be protected. You want to be weak and you want to be strong. 
You want to be, yes, all things to all people. Now, what women want is not that all mysterious. They want essentially what society tells them to want, and that's just what men want. They want what society tells them to want. And my sympathies go greatly to men. I have seen men refuse to stop working under the threat of death because they want to die with their boots on. That's what they want, that's what they get. They follow the motto of the Code of the West, stiff upper lip, so they become stiff. <laughs> They're never weak, except when they get a nose cold. <laughs> then there they are up in the bedroom, languishing, while women, those fragile creatures, with viral pneumonia are down in the kitchen <laughs> fixing him a cup of tea. <laughs> but that's the way human beings are. We're contradictory little creatures. We're never all of a piece. But women are considered to be fragile. On the other hand, not so fragile that you don't expect them to be 40% of the labor market at the present time and also take full responsibility for running their home. Not so fragile that anyone is at all surprised when a woman can fight like a tiger for the ones that she loves, and will do so. And the last person to stay alive at the Donner Pass of the Donner Party was a woman. We're not so fragile, strong as oxen. My, I'm inclined to think that those gentlemen who come up to me at cocktail parties and say, with a twinkle in their aging eyes, uh, viva la différence, <laughs> right on, brother, viva la différence, because the odds are on the women. Men burden themselves with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of insurance to take care of the poor little woman who's going to outlive them. Go down to St. Petersburg, Florida. The insurance companies know what they're doing. All beauty parlors, no barber shops. But they're not happy women down there. For the most part, women don't want to outlive their men, although a macabre joke that in a vindictive sort of way amuses me from time to time when I get mad at men, is of the lady who was no lady, whose husband died and left her several million dollars. And at the reading of the will, she was very touched when the lawyer said, and to my dear wife, I leave my residual estate several million dollars. And she wept. And she said, oh, Joe was such a wonderful man. I'd give $10,000 if he were alive today. <laughs> well, most women don't feel that way about men, because most women don't get a crack at several million dollars either. <laughs> most women are highly dependent on men economically, but that's not the whole story, as you know. I've never talked to a woman who, if you, didn't, if you pushed hard enough, no matter how much she loved men, no matter how much she loved her man, no matter how she protested about all that women's liberation stuff that was women's lib, that she was born liberated, saw no point in this, push her hard enough, use devious techniques, which I'm expert, and pretty soon you will elicit from her the most profound hostility to men. Only she... She cloaks it in different ways. They're such boys. They're such children. He can never find a sock. She starts putting him down in various ways. She would die for him, quite literally. But within her is this hostility. It's a them and us. She doesn't know what it's like to be a man. She only knows what it's like to be a woman. And there are problems. 
But I have never talked to a man, however much he loved his women, his wife, his daughter, his granddaughter, his mother. Push him hard enough, use the same manipulation, and before long you will elicit from him a profound distrust of women. What do they want? The business of women are both angels and temptresses, both devils and my mother. Because he doesn't know what it's like to be a woman, and he never will know. And there we face each other like Thurber's little creatures across a chasm, the war between the sexes. And the so-called women's liberation movement is not leading anything, really. It's a symptom. It's a symptom of this inability to communicate our innermost desires to each other, our innermost weaknesses, our innermost fears. We cover up, we lie, we manipulate each other because we're programmed to think that we must behave in a certain way. A woman is programmed, if you open a jar, if you can't open the jar of olives after you've wanged it and pounded it and so on, and you give it to him, and now the damn thing is just about ready to open. He turns it, it comes up, you say to him, oh, thanks, honey, I just couldn't do that. Now, of course, when he's not home, you do it. You work at it a little longer. But you're programmed to build his ego. Why not? We all have such terribly fragile egos. All of us. We all need constant reassurance that we exist. We need constant reassurance that we're not terrible people, really. Each of us knows the nasty, dishonest little thoughts and deeds that no one has picked up along the way, thank God, that we've done. Each of us knows that about ourselves if we're at all insightful. So we all need support. But what's happening to women is that they're out of date. Nobody needs them. If we could just get an artificial uterus, then we could even have procreation of the species because their major job only lasts a short period of time, not what they used to be. And suddenly women are beginning to be uneasy about the fact that it looks as if in the society that Galbraith was describing of the future, that her destiny is going to lie in her head, not her tail. And that's frightening, because even when she's been educated, she has not been taught to take that education seriously. She's had a cop-out. She didn't have to use the education. And now she's going to have to face up to a world which says to her, why did you go to college? And she says, to make me a better wife and mother. And he uses a four-letter word because he knows and she knows that what makes a good wife and mother has nothing to do with a bachelor's degree in Sanskrit. What makes a good wife and mother is what makes a good husband and father. A warmth of spirit, a tenderness, an ability to love and care an ability to protect the young and to let them go. That's what makes good parents. It's not sex aligned. And so you have to have a better reason to go to college when you say, well, it developed me as a person, but did it? Most women who go to college, when tested out years later, have not progressed very far in the skills that they were taught. There's been a gradual decline, which is very tragic. I'm not saying that every woman or every man with an education should do thus or so. Not at all. I'm just saying that we can no longer deny to ourselves that when you educate a human brain, you're in for trouble. We have educated millions of women, and we put them on the remainder shelf. They will have at least 30 years of a life, which is not homebound. But when a woman is 45 and her degree is 25 years old 
And I get dozens of them call me up daily. My phone rings off the hook. They want to do something. Volunteerism has not met the bill, and it's very easy to understand why. We need volunteers. It is the highest manifestation of human behavior to give of yourself without the coin of the realm in exchange. Yet why are women volunteers so denigrated? Because they are. They always tell me, oh, I've gone the volunteer route. They don't appreciate me. She's right, they don't. They don't. That's the way it is. This is society says you get what you pay for. Now, a woman of 45, she used to be at least economically safe in this regard. Society frowned upon her husband leaving her, assuming that they were both alive in that short life society. So marriages that jogged along up to then for whatever reason, held together usually, and she had some sense of even economic security and social security. She was Mrs. John Reynolds till the day she died. Now she may be Mrs. John Reynolds till the day she died, but there are two other Mrs. John Reynolds that he's picked up along the way. Because who wants a 50-year-old woman? Not a 50-year-old man. He wants someone closer to his own age, 21. And he can do it. The governor of my great state of Maryland waltzed out on his wife for the woman he loved with great fanfare. And everyone understood it. It's boring to be married to the same woman for 32 years. She's a grandmother now. He didn't marry a grandmother. Everyone understood it because the polls say he's going to be reelected. No social sanctions anymore on this. Everyone understood it, except maybe his old wife. She's a little confused. She did everything right. She was a wonderful wife and mother. She provided the dinner parties for the other politicians that helped to move him up the ladder. She worked in the primaries. She worked in the elections. She killed herself for him. She gave him her life, and then she discovered the saddest truth of all. You can't give anybody else your life. They have trouble enough leading their own. You can't ride piggyback on another human being. We've educated women. We've given them birth control and dishwasher. If you have more than two children, in the young generation now, you're a social think. What are you going to do with your life? Whatever society tells you to do with it. What's your husband going to do? Whatever society tells him to do. I have a grandson. Remarkable child, but I'm, I love the child dearly, but I'm seriously considering writing him out of my will because he's been programmed. First thing he said to me is, when I told him not to do something, he said, I wouldn't cry, Grandma. Boys don't cry. That was at the age of three. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I forgave him for that at the age of three. After all, there's still a few years where I can manipulate him. Uh, on the other hand, he has liberated parents, my son the doctor, my daughter-in-law the medical student, all liberated. And he's got me, the old Harridan that keeps, you know, trying to get the message across. Well, but the final blow, he asked me if his grandfather, that's my husband, was a doctor, like his father. And I said, no, your grandfather is a lawyer. And I said, you know, your Aunt Drew, that's my daughter the lawyer, is a lawyer. And he said, standing up straight like a strong little man, he looked me in the eye and said, she is not a lawyer, she's a she. My grandson. <laughs> now, it's going to be very hard to deprogram him. That's what is known as brainwashing. But I don't intend to give up quite. But you see, it's all a matter of conditioning. As I mentioned in Chicago, my son, until he was a little older, uh, was exposed to a lot of people at, at our home, both my husband's friends, my friends, mutual friends, who occasionally would refer to me as a woman scientist. 
you know, you always have to modify woman doctor, woman scientist, you know, not a man doctor. So he said to me, uh, Grandma, no, I'm sorry, this is my son. You say, I get the generations mixed. But this is my son, same little beast. And he said, Mommy, is there such of a thing as a man scientist? I said, well, I tell you, Jimmy, there are a few, but they're not worth a damn. <laughs> I figured he'd learn soon enough, and this was just getting some of my own back. <laughs> Didn't last very long. He came home one day, and he said, there are no women mathematicians, because women don't have the kind of brain for mathematics. Unfortunately, corporal punishment was frowned upon in my family because I'd have beaten the hell out of the kid on that one. Because I have always done the income tax and the bills. My husband, the lawyer, regards this as woman's work. Anything he doesn't want to do is woman's work by definition. So it's all in the way you're brought up. And I must say that I now have a husband who is becoming conditioned. The other day he said to me, Honey, did you notice that I took out your garbage? <laughs> and for my sins, I was just about to thank him when I remembered I was a liberated woman. And I snarled at him and I said, what do you mean, my garbage? It's our garbage. <laughs> and he said, my God, she's taking this stuff seriously. <laughs> now, he's been backing me every step of the way as long as I've been making life a misery for other men <laughs> in my department, at meetings of this kind. You see, I go around the country with one aim in view, really, and that is, you, you've all heard about the old buddy system. It's worked extremely well. The old school tie. Do you know a young guy who? And of course, you always know a young guy who. Well, my purpose in life now is to set up an old biddy system. <laughs> and I'm trying to find women who have made it, who are long in the tooth the way I am, and have nothing to lose, nothing to gain, nothing to lose, to go out in the hustings and take care of my granddaughter so that she doesn't have to go through all this nonsense. Because women are obviously going to be forced more and more into the labor market. Just to stay alive, a family's going to have more than one income. It's already happening in the middle class. And when that woman is underpaid, her husband is underpaid. When she is underutilized, then society has overpaid the bill. And we are none of us getting away free when you underutilize human brains. Women are strong and vigorous, and they are members of the species Homo sapiens, the thinking ones. And when I went down to Tennessee, and applied for a job just before World War I, and that chairman of the department said to me, I have never hired a woman, I will never hire a woman, go home and take care of your husband. He was a damn fool, because I was a highly trained physical chemist. Now the war liberated them. They bombed Pearl Harbor six months later, this prince of a fellow called me up and he said, Dr. Ramey, it is your patriotic duty. And I said, well, Dr. Beeler, I did what you told me. I went home and took care of my husband and I'm pregnant. And he brushed that off and said, Dr. Ramey, do you realize that our men are dying in the trenches? And you're bringing up this trivial business of morning sickness. So I said, okay. I came in. I taught until a few days before I delivered. 
I'm so fragile, I'm so little and fragile, I did what I had to do, morning sickness and all. Then after the war, you know it was my patriotic duty to do, because the men were coming back. Well, everyone suffers in that kind of structuring. And you know, women are children of God. In fact, my daughter, that's my daughter the lawyer, gave me a birthday present. It may sound to you slightly blasphemous, but I have it framed. Look at it occasionally, it cheers me up. And what it shows is the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, a segment of it in Michelangelo's grand style. And you remember, those of you who have seen it or seen pictures, Michelangelo went in for very muscular gods and men. And God is a very muscular fellow, reaching out a very strong muscular arm, extending the finger and creating man. But my poster is different. In my poster, it's the same style, but God is a lovely rounded woman with an afro. And she is reaching out a lovely rounded arm and she is creating a beautiful blonde. And the legend under my picture says, and God created woman in her own image. Now I feel that is not blasphemous. We are all God's children, all in God's image. God has neither ovaries nor testicles. And I feel that the fact that we have at each other constantly is not an absolute necessity of life. There are better ways to run a society. There are better ways to run cities. You heard some last night. There are better ways for men and women to interact. We need not drive our men to early coronaries because they feel that that's the way they must behave. And we need not drive our women to a kind of underutilization which puts them on tranquilizers for underuse, while at the same time their husbands are taking tranquilizers for overuse. And therefore, I like to close this kind of talk with a paraphrase of one of my favorite John Donne quotations, which I think is apropos. And that is that no woman is an island entire in herself. Every woman put down diminishes me, for I am part of humankind. And therefore, never sends an O for whom the bell tolls, my brothers and sisters. It tolls for thee. Thank you. <laughs>